All right, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, we are still just at the four o'clock hour, so we're gonna go ahead and just give it about 30 more seconds as I still see some attendees jumping in here. Now wait till I see that kind of taper off for a moment and then we will um, promptly get started. We certainly appreciate you all joining us this evening. All right, and it looks like a number of attendees are starting to slow. Well, no, maybe not. <laughs> All right, it looks like we're starting to stable off here. So we will go ahead and get started um, and just be respectful of everybody's time today. So um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jared Counterman. I'm the Associate Director of Student Resources here at Colorado State University Global. Um, pleased to welcome you. Um, to another uh, CSU Global Career Success webinar series tonight uh, with our guest speaker this evening, Dr. Vanessa Ann Klaus. Um, we certainly have a great program um, and are excited to share some of this information with you. Um, prior to, just wanna cover a couple of housekeeping items here. Um, please note that the session will be recorded um, and all registered attendants will receive a, a recording at the end of the event. Um, at the bottom of the screen, um, you will see uh, a chat button. Um, I'd love for everybody to introduce themselves, kind of tell us where you're zooming in from um, and anything relevant that you would hope to maybe learn today. Um, and then for any questions, I would ask that everybody use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Um, so that way we can easily track those. Uh, chat is great, but if you use that for the questions that you have, they may get uh, lost. So I will do my best to keep up. Um, and really quick, I'm going to go ahead and um, just launch a quick first poll just to understand who's joining us today. Um, so hopefully everybody can go ahead and hopefully everybody sees that poll pop up here in just a moment. Um, and then while you guys are answering that and introducing yourself in the chat, I'm going to go ahead and uh, just like to introduce uh, Dr. Klaus here. So Dr. Klaus is a passionate educator who boasts uh, both HR experience and academic experience. Um, after obtaining her PhD from Texas A&M, um, she fulfilled her dream of opening a brick and mortar business, uh, which allowed her to apply her theoretical knowledge in a real world setting. Um, after spending time in the retail industry um, and, some and some tough competition, sorry, it gets a little tongue twisted, um, Vanessa decided to return to academia. Um, she's been working at CSU Global now since 2014. Uh, Vanessa now owns another business, um, which has been a great journey, um, and she loves helping individuals grow and advance their careers um, and enjoys applying her HR, um, her HR and business knowledge to enhance the employee experience. Uh, Vanessa believes that all individuals can achieve their career goals, um, though some just need an extra push and support. So she's currently a senior faculty associate um, for the human resources programs at CSU Global, and anybody that is in that program um, may already recognize her name. So I'd like to uh, just turn it over to her and welcome her at this point. Thank you very much. Okay, everyone should be able to see my screen. I'm excited to chat with each of you or to give this presentation about salary negotiation. And what I've done um, is I've split up information into two different major sections. So I will be talking about the salary negotiation process as an applicant once you've received a job offer and then also about the process from an employee standpoint, if you're a current employee of an organization. Um, so moving through our agenda, um, first I'm going to discuss some information about what salary negotiation is. Then I want to explore information about your rights as an employee and also what you need to remember in general throughout the salary negotiation process. As I just mentioned, this presentation is broken down into information about pre-employment total reward negotiation and then also negotiating your salary while you're a current employee of an organization. 
And then we will go over some final tips and techniques about what to remember. And then hopefully we can answer some questions too. So what is salary negotiation? Well, I don't want to read any of you the definition because that's pretty basic and you can read it on here. But what you've probably noticed is that throughout the years, salary negotiation has become much more common than it once was. In fact, in 2010, only about 10% of applicants actually negotiated their salary. And in 2017, approximately 17% of applicants negotiated their salary. Now what's interesting about this is a study later came out that found that 70% of managers and HR professionals expected individuals to negotiate their salary However, the majority of people did not. So there are some problems with not negotiating your salary when you have the opportunity to do so. But you'll see a poll up here that says, did you negotiate your salary? When you had your last job offer, did you actually negotiate your salary? And it will be interesting to see how many people did and how many did not. As I mentioned, managers expect people to negotiate. Oh, good. We have the poll results. So out of the individuals who are here and who responded, we have 106 participants right now. 37% um, of you did negotiate your salary and 63% of you did not negotiate your salary. So that's okay. Honestly, when I've taken on roles before in other organizations, I didn't negotiate my salary. I thought whatever salary I get, whatever compensation offer I get, that's what I expect and I'm fine with it. But the problem is um, there are a lot of differences in terms of salary. So I'm gonna turn off my camera for just one second so I can go over a few statistics with you. Um, the first thing to remember is that based upon information offered in 2020, 53% of applicants are actually missing out on negotiating their salary. And unfortunately, researchers have found a huge divide in terms of the compensation offered based upon gender and ethnicity, and also based upon one's generation. So these statistics I'm going to give you are pretty basic, but I think they're important to point out um, because these different demographic factors can influence how an individual is compensated and also if they're willing to ask for additional compensation. And why do I say that? Typically, women are offered less than their male counterparts. Um, the research says between 83 cents to 86 cents, sometimes higher, sometimes lower than males are offered. Okay, and females are less likely to negotiate their salary than males. On top of that, we have some huge differences in terms of ethnicities. 87% of black or black men make 87 cents to every dollar that a white man makes and Asian men make a dollar and 15 cents to every dollar that a Caucasian male makes. On top of that, there are generational differences that also impact the salary negotiation process. At one point in time, and I don't know how many of you fall into the category of being a millennial, but millennials were not negotiating their salary. And that could be because of a variety of factors. It could be because of what they experienced during the Great Recession. It could be because of limited opportunities. It could be about the fact that they couldn't break through some of the requirements needed to negotiate um, or to apply for a position, but this has impacted generations too. Now I'm excited to report 
that millennials are more likely to negotiate their salary than our older generations. So that's good. We're making progress here. But what you need to know is that all of these trends impact individuals and impact the salary negotiation process. So that's just a little bit of a brief history. So there is another question up here. Um, what factors impacted your willingness to negotiate your salary? A fear, a lack of knowledge about how to negotiate your salary. Maybe you just didn't know that you could negotiate like me, or maybe you thought otherwise. You know, I have a Masters of Science in Human Resources and Organizational Development and a PhD in Human Resource Development. And I can tell you, for the longest point in time, I just thought, you know, whatever offer I get, I'm going to take it. Well, something changed at one point in time. I actually was offered a on-ground teaching position at a very good school on the East Coast. And they gave me my salary offer. And at one point um, when I opened up the email, and this sounds bad, but I just bursted out laughing. Um, the offer was so low and I couldn't uh, even live on what they gave to me. So I went back to HR and said, um, I can see what other individuals are making because this is a public university and the salaries of these individuals are posted online. I know that you're paying me less than my male counterparts. I know that you're paying me less maybe because of my age. How can we make this work? And we, there was too much of a difference between what I needed and what they were willing to pay. But the point is, it took me a long time to get there. And part of that is knowing your rights as an employee. Right now, more than ever, you have leverage. This is a market that people consider to be very hot. Employees have more rights and have more of a voice than they did in years past. And because of that, people are starting to demand that they are compensated fairly. Now, I don't want you to think because I say people demand that you should just go in there and demand an amount. No, that's not how we negotiate our salary. But the purpose of knowing this is that you have power right now as an employee. The reason why I provided information about Maslow's hierarchy of needs right here is because these needs are critical to remember. I'm going to throw out a number here. Let's say for the purpose of this discussion, when I received the offer from this university that I just spoke about, it was $60,000. Okay, now I want you to think about living on the East Coast, think New York or Boston, on a $60,000 salary. It's, it's pretty difficult. Then I want you to think of these different factors. Are my physiological needs met? Can I have food based upon that salary, shelter, water, so on? Yeah, I could. But am I going to be happy with the level in which my needs are met? No. The point of showing you this is if your basic needs are not met, as an employee, you're not going to want to stick around with that organization for an extended period of time. Now, we all need to be able to eat, to have a place to sleep, to afford our bills, and so on. But those are some pretty basic needs. As we move up Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we see that our needs become more specific. We begin focusing on the basic needs and move all the way up to self-fulfillment. The point of this is, if your basic needs are not met, are you going to be motivated? For me, that's a no. If my basic needs are not addressed, am I going to come to work with a positive attitude and a desire to be a strong contributor, contributor to the workplace? No. So 
if your basic needs are not being met, my best guess is you either need to negotiate your salary or you need to find another position eventually. The other thing you need to know when there, the salary negotiation happens is that there's a time and a place it's inappropriate in a board meeting to tell someone I need a raise. That should be done behind closed doors with the proper personnel. Why do I say this? Well, you'd actually be surprised what certain people forget when they become so passionate about their salary. And I understand this is a touchy subject for everyone. But about a month ago, I was in a meeting with a group of people and this man voiced that he needed more money. And it was shocking to hear because that was neither the time nor the place to have that type of discussion. And it became very off-putting to everyone who was in the room. So as we move through this process and as you go out and you try to negotiate your salary as uh, applicant who is given an offer, or as someone who is currently working for an organization, know that you have power, know that you can voice your needs, but also know that there's a time and a place for everything. Okay, so let's talk about the pre-employment total rewards negotiation process. First of all, if you get a job offer from an organization, they like you. That's one of the first things that you need to remember. Most companies don't just make an offer because they think that you're not going to be successful. They're hiring you because they see something in you. They're excited to have you as an employee and for you to join the team. This is a very good point in time to see what they come back with. So often what will happen, and I'm sure all of you have experienced this, is once you're given an offer, you're contacted by either HR or the manager, and you're told something to the extent of, I'm sorry, I just went, got off that page. Um, here is your salary, here is your, um, the rewards or the benefits that we're offering. Once you get that information, you need to remember that you have the opportunity now to leverage the fact that they like you. You need to advocate for yourself. So what does advocating for yourself look like? It means coming back in a professional manner, explaining what you need. Now, when you say your needs, there's a lot of different research out there that says you should give a range or you should give an exact number. I believe that you should give an exact number, but I'm gonna give you a piece of advice. Always give a higher number than what you want. Why do I say that? Because if you get the exact amount that you want, typically during the negotiation pro process, people are going to come in a bit lower. So by giving a higher number than you expect to get, you might likely settle with the employer on the ideal number. Now this doesn't work every time. There are things that you need to know when being an advocate for yourself. You have to know the salary range. You have to know what is the typical amount that people are paid for in your industry for a comparable position. And there's information through the Bureau of Labor Statistics and other online resources that um, are actually in this PowerPoint presentation in the notes that you can further explore to see if you're compensated a fair amount for what you're doing. Now, if I get an offer of $50,000 or $60,000 for a job, and I know that that amount isn't going to be enough for me, I need to come back with a number. But if I come back with a number that far exceeds the cost of living in the area, if it's a position where you go into an office, or also exceeds the salary range, then most likely I'm not going to be able to find a happy medium with the employer. 
do you see how if I came in with the, or came back with the amount of $120,000, but I was being offered $60,000, maybe the organization would be off put. This is why understanding the salary range is important. The other thing I want each of you to remember is that every individual comes to the table with a goal. All of us have agendas. Your organization that you work for wants to compensate you, but they don't want to pay you the most. I mean, what's the ultimate goal of most companies? It's to make a profit. So can you go in there and demand X amount? Absolutely. But if you're not in touch with what the organization is willing to pay and also what the salary range is and also other factors such as comparable jobs um, in your area and industry, then you most likely are not going to be able to have an aligned agenda or goals with that of the organization. And then after all of this, you need to decide, let's say these conversations go south and the organization says, you know, we gave you this offer, $60,000. We're willing to negotiate and give you $70,000, but I really wanted $120,000. I know that we're not going to see eye to eye. Now, there are factors that influence if I should take that offer, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But if I know personally that my basic needs cannot be met with the salary I'm being offered, then I'm going to walk away. And that's why I put up this um, quote right here about you've got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. And I see a lot of questions coming in and I promise you that I am going to um, get to as many of these as I possibly can. Um, so keep sending them in. Uh, okay, so the next very important slide is negotiating your salary when you're employed. This year alone, inflation went up by 6.2%. Most individuals, if they're getting a raise, are only getting a 2 to 3% raise. That means you're poorer than you were the year before when you were making X amount. I don't know how many of you use social media platforms like Reddit, but there's this um, interesting sub on there called Anti-Work, where people have been writing in about their complaints associated with being an employee right now. And people are saying, they can't even make, meet their basic needs and keep up with inflation based upon their salary. So what do you do then? This is where you have to be an advocate for yourself. First of all, if you've been with your organization for six or more months, I typically believe you have the right um, at that point, even though you have the right at any point in time, but I think a six month period is a good amount of time at minimum to go to your employer and say, here's what I have accomplished. Here's what I'm contributing to the organization. Here is my value. Now, if the organization doesn't recognize that, we have other problems because it's hard to recognize or to advocate for yourself when you're not even recognized for what you're putting in. So my best piece of advice is when you're working for an organization, know what you bring to the company. Highlight what you've accomplished before going into any meeting where you're negotiating your salary. Explain your tenure with your company. So what, what it, has it looked like since you've been employed? What have you done? How have you contributed? Not only how have you contributed, but how have you been compensated? Are you assessed on a regular basis? So is your performance assessed? During your performance reviews, are you given raises or bonuses? 
all of these factors are important to write down. So when you come to the table and are speaking with your supervisor about your expectations and why you want a bonus or I should say a raise, you can present all of the information necessary. The next point on here is consider the internal and external environment. What do I mean by that? We all have some idea how our organization is performing. Unless you're working in an organization where there's no transparency. So am I at the toughest time in my organization going to go to the uh, director of my department and say, I need a raise of $50,000 to stay employed? No, I know that that's an unrealistic goal that the organization won't likely agree that they don't have the funding and therefore I'm probably going to get rejected in what I'm hoping for. Also, you need to know the external environment. So what's happening outside of your company? Is your industry growing and booming? Are there bright days ahead for your company? Has your company increased in terms of their profitability since the onset of COVID? And there are plenty of organizations that have. If these factors are both positive, if you're working in an environment or an organization where you look at what's going on around you and it's positive, the company is growing and you're looking external to the company, you know that there's a strong um, job or a hot job. Um, I'm sorry, a hot workplace. Um, there are a lot of opportunities. People see that these opportunities for employment continue to pop up. Then you know that it might be a good time to ask for a raise. Now, I'm not saying you should wait until all the factors align perfectly. But what I am saying is be realistic. Not everyone is going to get a raise when they want. So let's talk about that for a second. Let's say I go to my organization and know that even though they're not performing as well as they should um, be or hope to be at this point in time, I know that I still deserve a uh, um, raise. What do I do? I present them with all the information. Then let's say they come back and say, you know, we just can't do it. Times are tough right now. What are my other options? This is where you can get creative in some organizations. Now hear me, you can't get creative in all organizations. There are some organizations where there are salary ranges. There are some organizations that do not allow people to be um, creative in terms of the benefits that they're offered, but there are some organizations that do. So I can tell you when a friend of mine applied for a position, she said to me, you know, I really don't love some of these benefits I'm offered, but I'm just going to take the job. And I said to her, why? Um, why would you take it without seeing if they're willing to come to some type of an agreement? What do you want that's different than what they're offering? And what she said to me is, I want more vacation days. I said, you know, they've already made you this offer. Go for it. Ask them for more vacation days. And guess what happened? She got those vacation days. Then I had a friend who was working for an organization for five years. And he said to me, I haven't gotten a raise in five years. And I said, go to the company and explain why you believe you deserve a raise. And he said, well, I can't do that because the company is struggling. I said, well, what would make you stay with your company? And he's, if it isn't money, if they can't give you a raise right now, he said, well, if they offered in six months to review this again, um, my raise again, I said, okay. And then I said, what else? And he said, well, maybe if they gave me the option to work from home, I said, go in and ask for that. Don't walk away from the table or don't even, uh, or 
remember to approach the table before you give up. So these are the considerations that you need to remember. Um, there is flexibility in a lot of organizations, not all, but many. And right now, especially if you're in a position that's highly specialized, you do have leverage. So I want to talk about an industry where I know that things are booming and they cannot find enough people to fill positions. IT, tech people. There are so few tech people. So what are organizations doing? They're competing with other companies to find the best talent. What are they offering? They're not just offering a great salary. They're also offering great benefits. So what do you need to remember based upon this? The sa your salary isn't the only thing, first of all, that you can negotiate. You can negotiate your benefits too, especially if getting a raise is not possible at that point in time. But it's important to put in writing in X number of months, we will discuss this topic again. So five months, three months, six months down the road, you go back into your supervisor's office or into HR's office and say, we had a conversation a while ago about my salary and what I want or hope to get. You explained to me that it wasn't a good point in time for the company. You gave me some great other additional um, benefits. You said to come back in X amount of months. Where do we go from here? That's always a good option. The other thing to remember is to stay level-headed. I've seen a lot of people blow up at organizations because they don't get what they want. And honestly, I understand why people get upset. People oftentimes are underpaid um, in a lot of roles and it's unfortunate and it continues to be a problem. But what you need to remember is that sometimes this is not a personal thing. Um, this goes back to everyone having an agenda. You also need to recognize that the process of obtaining approval or being denied for what you want takes time. Sometimes managers don't have the jurisdiction to say, okay, so-and-so, you asked for a $20,000 raise, I'll give it to you. Things don't typically work like that. There's a system in organizations that you need to go through. So you need to give things a bit of time. Oftentimes, a quality manager will say to you, okay, I understand your concerns. I understand what you need. I need a few weeks to explore this further. And at that point in time, you stay level-headed and you wait for an answer. Now, if they say I'll know in a week and it's been a week and however many days, you can follow up. That's totally your right as an employee. The last point to remember is you need to decide if you're willing to stay or go. Here's what I mean by that. If you know that you're underpaid, if you know that your organization isn't going or refuses to give you what you're hoping for in terms of salary, if you know that they won't give you any other options in terms of additional benefits that will not only satisfy you temporarily, but keep you motivated, then you have to make the decision if you should stay or should, if you should go. Do you have other opportunities out there? How are things looking job-wise? Do you have savings to rely upon? These are all factors that only you can answer. So I want each of you to remember that before you get super upset about not getting a raise and say, okay, effective immediately, I'm gone, you need to remember that there are factors that influence that decision too. And also you need to ensure that you have some type of opportunity or backup. Now there are exceptions to that. If the culture is toxic, if you don't feel like you're being treated fairly and so on, there's always an exception to these kind of rules that I'm giving you. 
but typically you want to ensure that there's something available on the back burner or that you have another opportunity that could present itself in the future before you walk out. And here's one other thing to remember. And then I want to get to some of these great questions. Um, if you are so upset about the fact that you're not getting what you're worth as an employee, don't quit your job immediately. I've run into this issue with so many people I know who I understand walking off the job at a point or saying, you want to know what? I've been treated fair, unfairly. I've been taken advantage of effective immediately. I quit. Why do I say be careful and try to at least give sufficient notice? It's not just about burning bridges anymore. It's about the fact that you can potentially lose out on paid time off that you have accrued if you just decide to leave immediately. So each state has different laws that you need to be aware of in terms of that, but these are considerations that you have to make for yourself. So let's move to this next slide and then go through these questions that everyone has. So I'm not going to read this to you, but this is a pretty good synopsis of what we've gone over. Um, being specific about your needs is huge. Um, coming prepared to meetings is critical. Asking for offers in writing. That's one thing I didn't cover. If your organization says to you, okay, we're going to give you this raise that you wanted, Sarah, and you deserve it, make sure it's in writing somewhere. I see so many examples of people who have negotiated or renegotiated their salary with an employer, and then the employer forgets about that conversation. Now, we know they probably didn't forget about it, but the paperwork's not processed, they aren't being given what the organization said they would. So if you have a meeting with your supervisor and they say to you, okay, we agree we're going to give you a um, raise this year of 10% of your annual salary, follow up after that meeting. I cannot begin to stress the importance of documentation. HR documents everything, everything. You need to be an advocate for yourself and document information too. Follow up after meetings when you have these conversations. Ensure that you're getting detailed information in writing. Um, there's a lot more that we can cover. And I don't know if this PowerPoint will go out to everyone. I'm hoping it does. But I do want to get to some of your questions. So I am going to start from the bottom, if that's okay. Yeah, and Vanessa, actually, there were a couple, I'll, I'll try and save you from scrolling through all of them. Um, okay. There were a couple of uh, uh, common questions that people had. So essentially one of the ones that I saw reoccurring was, what's your recommendation when employers ask for salary, for salary requirements from the applicants, um, especially before anything's disclosed or an offer letter is provided? Okay, so that is a great question. I love that. So there's a lot of conversation right now in HR about the fact that organizations continue to keep salary information private. They don't give a range at all, which is really problematic and it's led to a lot of frustration among applicants. It's This is a hard question to answer because I tell people to know what they're worth, but if they want to get their foot in the door with an organization, they also don't want to put down a number that's too extreme one way or the other. So what I would do if a recruiter or someone asked me, um, what do you expect for this position? I always come back with a follow-up question. Well, what's the salary range? And if they're like, well, we really don't publish that, then you can respond back after doing a bit of research and say something of the effect of based upon industry average for this position in this location, this is what I think is fair. 
Now, if you don't think that the salary range that you found is fair, then you can give your number. But I think it ultimately, and why this is a huge discussion in HR is because a lot of individuals immediately either give too low of a number or don't know how to respond and just don't respond. Or they feel like once they give a number, the organization's going to take that at face value. So I always recommend coming back with questions. What's the range? Okay, you won't give me the range? Okay, well, based upon my research, this is what I think is appropriate. Here's where I think I should fall on the salary range. And then just be honest. Unfortunately, salary negotiation, especially when you um, are an applicant is really an art and it's very strategic. So I wish I could say this is exactly what you should do, but I'm gonna give you my best piece of advice based upon my experience and research, but ultimately um, that advice is to come back with questions and see what information you can get out of HR first. Wonderful. and then. Um somewhat related, what about, what would your advice be if uh, organization asked what your current salary was during the interview process? Would you give an actual number? Would you give a range? Would you, again, kind of approach it in a similar fashion with, a with asking additional questions? So I would say I don't feel comfortable disclosing that. And let me tell you why. There are actually individuals who are proposing specific laws about this right now. Um, when people find, and there are legal battles going on about this subject too. When people find out how much you have been paid previously, they're not necessarily going to say, I'm going to pay Vanessa, um, let's say 60,000 because she was making 50,000 at the last job. They're going to want to get you for the amount that they think that they can. So what am I trying to say here? I always write in those, um, when I fill out an application, when it asks for my salary, current salary, I put in zeros. Why do I do that? First of all, I don't think it's the company's business to know what I got paid previously because frankly, it's a new job. It's a new organization. And because of that, I want to get paid based upon what they feel is acceptable than based upon what a past employer might have offered me because they don't know my situation. I could have be leaving a current organization because they haven't paid me enough. So if I box myself into a range, then that's a big problem. So at that point, I would just say, you know, I don't feel comfortable saying that. And then if they come back and say, well, we need that information. This is where I think we as applicants need to ask ourselves why. Um, you know, this is really hard to say, but um, we all know this, not all companies behave in an ethical manner. And the thing you have to ask yourself when you're working with any HR professional or recruiter is, does this individual represent the type of an organization that I want to work for? So if an a recruiter comes back to me and says, I need that information that's critical. I know in the back of my mind from an HR perspective, that's so they can see what they can pay me. Then I think to myself, is this the type of company I want to be with? And the answer is no, it isn't. Um, as I said, there are laws that are being um, well, there are actually cases about this right now, but there are also uh, lawmakers who are working on passing laws to eliminate some of these specific questions from being addressed. Well, I know Colorado just recently passed a law where if you're posting a job here in the state, you have to actually provide a range as well, but hopefully Yay. other states will get to that. Um, yeah, and then I, <laughs> yeah, and then um, I think similarly, similarly related to that 
question. I think then we can move on, on to other topics or other questions. But at what point in the process, um, in the interview process, should you bring up salary range if they don't post it? Obviously, um, you know, it's it's a lot of work to go through job applications and nobody wants to waste their time if it's going to be well underneath um, just the basic requirements that a potential employee is going to need. So what would you say in that situation? So I actually saw this on Reddit the other day in the anti-work um, sub that I always follow. Um, by the way, it's not all about not wanting to work. It's just the title of the sub, just so you all know. And a lady reached out to a recruiter and said, um, I'm so excited to interview with your company. Could you give me information about the salary range? And the recruiter shot back a message like, that's very bold of you to ask at this point. Um, I don't think personally it's bold to ask, but from a strategic standpoint, if they don't post it, I, if you're really interested in the role, I would wait until your interview with the company, your first interview, and then during that point in time, ask. If you feel like, you know, I'm not 100% set on this position and I want to at least know before I spend my time or waste my time, because ideally it can be a waste of time, um, going through the interview process, then you can ask a recruiter. I think recruiters are becoming more open to these questions because let's face it, none of us, well, maybe some of us, but very few of us actually work just because we love it and we're independently wealthy. Most of us work because we have bills to pay, but we also hopefully love what we do, right? So the thing for each of you to remember is if you're in a position where you need to know that information before you dedicate your time to interviewing with a company, then ask. Hopefully these recruiters will come back and understand. And I think a lot more recruiters do understand now that people um, need a job oftentimes to afford their bills but not every recruiter is like that. And then that just goes back to the question. If you can't get a straight answer about your salary or even a salary range, is that the company you wanna work for? And if they're defensive about that, that's a problem too. Red flags, certainly. Yes, red flags. <laughs> <laughs> uh, culture is a, is a huge component to the interview process. So. It is. <laughs> All right. Um, another kind of common theme question. We got two in regards to kind of public private sector um, questions. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, when for those that are working within the public sector where the job and the salary, or, well, the salary is, is notated as kind of preset, um, you know, is there still leverage there if it's say, you know, uh, working for the state or working for any other, you know, public sector roles? You know, um, I work obviously for the university and this was something that came up when I was applying for the position and offer for, I said, this is, I was told this is a salary and this is what we offer. There's not room for negotiation only because they're um, for my particular position at that point in time, there was actual figure um, that HR had settled on. Um, and I, I wanted my job and I love what I do. So I said, okay, that's fine. Um, could you come back and say, are you sure there's no wiggle room? Absolutely. But just know that typically when these hard and fast numbers are presented, there's a reason why. And there really isn't that much wiggle room, if any. Um, so unfortunately, what you'll typically find is no. When you're given that type of an answer, um, you're not going to be able to negotiate your salary. Now, the, there's a lot of good parts about working in the public sector. Our benefits are phenomenal. Um, you know, there's so many great parts about working in the public sector, but there are also sometimes is a tendency for salary to be a little bit lower than some people desire. 
but typically the benefits for the most part can make up for the not lower compensation, but um, not as competitive as industry compensation. Do I think it's a bad idea to go back and say, are you sure there's no wiggle room? Absolutely not. Um, but just be prepared that you're probably going to be told there's, this is what we offer and it is what it is. Wonderful. And then, I mean, not wonderful, but <laughs> thank you for, <laughs> for your insight on that. Um, but it does help. And then um, in a similar, you know, on a similar note, what about individuals who are looking to make a shift from public sector to the private sector? And I'm sure this is going to be a hard question to answer, to answer but, um, you know, is there, you know, should people be looking for any specific type of percent increase um, when moving from public to private? Um, honestly, there's no exact percent increase that I've ever seen published um, because I think it also goes back to the benefits that you get oftentimes working in the public sector as compared to the private sector, oftentimes, but not always. Um, what I would say is that looking at the Bureau of Labor Statistics and what is being offered by most organizations um, when they benchmark different salary ranges for different job descriptions is probably your best bet to give you a baseline number rather than saying, okay, I worked in the private sector, I wanna make a transition into the, or the public sector, I wanna transition into the private sector, I expect X amount. It's better to base stuff on um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics website than come up with an actual percentage. Wonderful. But hopefully what you're going to find is that percentage is a lot higher in the um, private sector as compared to the public sector. Wonderful. Yeah, and ONET Online, uh, which is powered by the you know, Bureau of Labor Statistics, that's a great site because it does provide a, a nice range and it does go um, state specific, um, which is always a, yeah, which is always a great resource for anybody that, um, is not familiar with that, uh, I'll pop it here in the chat as well so everybody can just take a quick look, but you can search by industry, um, it gives you a bunch of information in regards to uh, industries, job titles, uh, and then like I said, the nice breakdown by state and um, a, a low, a median, and a high end for salaries as well. Um, Should we think, say something about, um sorry to interrupt, but yeah, about yeah. what we offer students through um, Connect and stuff that they, if they do have some more of these questions that maybe we can't answer during the time, or they do want to speak with a career coach, those opportunities? Yeah, I will, I'll plug those really quick. I, um, just so that way we can get through uh, some other okay. questions. But um, for any questions that don't necessarily get answered this evening, um, please feel free to reach out to us at career.center at csuglobal.edu. Um, we'll make sure to get those addressed um, directly for each individual. And then also, as uh, Dr. Klaus had mentioned, we do provide uh, personalized career coaching as well based on industry specific career coaches. So, um, you know, Vanessa is great as far as these types of questions go. So even if you're in accounting or information technology, um, she would be a great resource to connect with directly if you're looking for more general um, hiring practices and uh, questions. Otherwise, you can certainly reach out and schedule those sessions with a career coach that's in your specific areas, again, teaching and learning, um, cybersecurity, et cetera. And then also, um, before anybody starts to apply for jobs, if you have not already, uh, we also provide personalized resume reviews as well as cover letters. So um, everybody, just like interviewing and job applications, these are all skills that people should continuously work to develop, um, even though we've probably all been through that probably more times than anybody wants to care to admit. Um, it is an exercise muscle, so make sure that you do uh, take advantage of those resources. And then there's always a bunch of self-help resources as well. And you can navigate to the Career Center directly through either your student portal um, or through the uh, 
or through Canvas as well. And then for any of our alumni that are, that are here as well, um, these services continue to be available for free for you as well um, for a lifetime. So these are not something that you lost access to uh, following um, your graduation and the completion of any certificates that you may have completed as well. So please take advantage of it. Um, they're great, valuable resources. Um, that you would pay a significant amount um, if you went and sought that out external from CSU Global. So, um, but yeah, um, all right. So let's get back to some questions. So uh, it, another question, and you had mentioned this earlier, Vanessa, about um, you know possibly negotiating different benefits. So um, one person asked, how is that legal if you know let's say you and i are in the same role but i'm getting more vacation time than you um isn't doesn't have to does don't benefits have to be equally applied um for employees or is that not the case um so no from everything i have experienced and read there are some benefits that are mandated by federal and state laws that have to be um offered to all employees but there are ways around other benefits too so i know and i can give this example he won't get upset when my husband applied for a job they offered some ridiculous amount of vacation time and i was like would you really take an offer with what they're giving you and he said well should i negotiate and i said absolutely um, so things that are not necessarily specific in the employee handbook about a maximum amount. Um, so if it said employees can only accrue a maximum of five weeks of vacation during their tenure of employment, um, then that would set a standard that no one could exceed that amount. But um, usually what you'll find in employee handbooks is the minimum is provided and then there is wiggle room. Now, a lot of these rules you need to remember differ by state um, and ultimately federal law trumps all other laws. Um, so what I mean by that is um, there are certain laws that you are always uh, privy to federal laws, and then there are state laws, and then there are just additional benefits that your employer can give to you. And um, benefits are either mandated or they are optional. And when there is that wiggle room, which a lot of organizations do give to employees, it's not illegal for that type of an offering. Awesome, thank you. And then what about, uh, and somebody kind of mentioned that this feels like a cop-out method. What about when somebody, uh, when an employer comes at you after trying to negotiate salary and they talk about the total compensation, which you had mentioned as well, and it goes into that same question um, also, but how would you approach that if, you know, I know that I'm, I like you had mentioned, I have amazing benefits and it's going to be hard for a private sector employer possibly to meet those same benefits that I am receiving. So um, should you go into these conversations with kind of a, a general idea of your total compensation before you negotiate? Um, I guess I'm kind of, I don't want to say confused, but I, I kind of have an idea of what's being said. But so essentially what you're saying is that um, it almost seems like a cop out when an organization gives justifies a lower salary because of better benefits. Is that what's being Correct. said? Correct. Yep. Yeah. I guess here's the thing to remember. You have to decide what's most important to you. So for me, am I going to take a position with the company and make a very large salary, but maybe not get the benefits that I want and I need? No, I've actually left um, an organization that was paying me a lot of money to get better benefits. Um, so it's... I don't want to say it's a cop out, but remember that benefits are expensive for organizations. And if you don't want the benefits um, that are offered 
by your organization and you feel like they pay too low of a salary um, and their justification is benefit-based, then maybe it's not the best organization to work in. I love my benefits. I would trade my benefits for a pay increase of fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 because I know how much these benefits are worth. No, I, I agree. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then let's see what some of the other questions are. And, and um, we're getting through quite a few of them. I know we still have a, bent, a bunch, but we are right at five o'clock. And I certainly, Vanessa, want to be respectful of your time. If you have just a we moment or two more, more, we can go ahead. Yeah. Okay. We can go ahead and answer a few more. And, um, and then uh, for the attendees, if you do need to jump offline, we will be sending out this recording as well. So um, you don't need to feel like you're pressured to stick around or anything like that. But I think one of the other uh, questions that I came across that was pretty interesting, um, Vanessa, was what about, uh, you know, should you negotiate your salary if it's a grant funded position? Um, typically, there's an amount that is allotted for salary um, based upon the grant, but that is something that you can talk about. Um, I, I, I don't want to ever tell any of you not to negotiate um, because that would just be counterintuitive to what we discussed, but just know that there are sometimes limitations. But um, with grants, oftentimes there's amount set aside for salary and other types of expenses, but you could always ask if there's wiggle room there. Um, and my philosophy is, what's the worst that someone can tell you if you ask? No. Okay, no, the answer is no. Now, where do I go from here? So always remember that you can ask, you just might not get the answer that you want. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then, um, and I guess that, that actually answers the same question. We had a similar question from um, someone who's technically an independent contractor, but they are hired on through the organization. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how it, any any different advice for somebody that's uh, working in that capacity as opposed to a true full-time employee? Sometimes independent contractors have more leverage. Um, typically what will happen when people are an independent contractor is they will often make a higher salary than an employee because you don't have all of the benefits of a full-time employee. So I definitely think that you can ask if there is that type of an opportunity for an increase. Um, sometimes it won't be allowed, but um, there's nothing wrong with seeing what's available. The one thing I want um, whomever is an independent contractor to remember is that there, and this, I could go off on a tangent about this, but I'll make this really quick. Organizations have oftentimes been misclassifying job positions so they don't have to pay a full-time employee and give them full compensation and full-time benefits. So what you need to do as an independent contractor is really ensure that you have the um, job description of a true independent contractor. I'm not saying that's true for your organization. I'm just saying this for any independent contractor in general, because there's been a lot of companies, and this is this was really something that happened a great deal throughout the past five years, where independent contractors were being hired, but essentially they were employees. But the, as I said, the organization just didn't want to give them the benefits that are offered to employees. So ensure that your description is truly aligned with that of an independent contractor. Wonderful. But yes, the short answer is you can ask. Absolutely. And that was my assumption, like you said, as you mentioned earlier, uh, never, it never hurts to ask. The answer is always gonna be no if you never ask, right? Exactly. <laughs> so, um, well, we are, like I said, um, we are past time. I will, uh, work to grab everybody's question that we may have not directly answered. I'm going to do that right now. Um, again, if you have any follow-up questions that you would like to ask us, 
Um, please feel free to reach out to us by email at career.center at csuglobal.edu. Um, you're also welcome to schedule a one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, career coaching session either with Dr. Klaus or with any of the other industry-specific career coaches that we have. Um, I did provide our email address in the chat for everybody, and it, and I also provided the uh, URL for ONET online as well. So that way, if, for those of you who have not visited that site, I would definitely recommend checking that out, especially as you continue to move forward within just your career journey. So um, always a helpful resource and always gives you a good vantage point of skills, knowledge, um, work that you may be doing, especially if you're transitioning into careers, and then importantly and appropriate to today's topic, uh, salary and some ranges based on your individual states. So um, with that, uh, I will go ahead and wrap us up. Um, Vanessa, any, any last comments that you would like to share before I go ahead and uh, end tonight's webinar? Yeah, I just read two more things. Um, there's never an inappropriate time to ask for a raise. Um, and then if you um, if you want to negotiate your salary when you're getting back into the industry, definitely do the benchmarking. And then, yeah, thanks everyone for attending. I really appreciate it. Wonderful. Well, thank you again, everybody. Have a wonderful evening and we will hopefully see you at our next webinar series. Take care.